you know, this is the first year that Bampton has been included in the Bampton and Bampton Historical Society. This is our first meeting in Bampton. You're all very welcome, new members, visitors, everybody. We are indebted to David Lloyd, A, for allowing us to have this meeting in his beautiful church, and even more for telling us about it. David, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, if your mind start wandering, I mean, let, let them wander around and look at, look at the, uh, the things around you. And uh, if you see the bat this evening, then uh, that will be an added bonus. Um, I'm going to split the talk um, into three unequal parts, um, so that, you know, after, after some minutes of me going on, at least you've got a, you've got a chance to wriggle about and stand up or whatever, because the pews are not exactly the most comfortable seats uh, to be had. Um, there will be two sort of fairly equal halves and then a little coda at the end uh, before we move in the direction of uh, liquid refreshment over there. Um, at, the, at the end, um, I hope that you will uh, mill around and uh, perhaps clutching your glass will we'll walk around and have a look at uh, different parts of the church which hopefully I've been able to say something about um, during, during the talks. And I will also be around so if you want to ask questions at the end, um, of the, you know, as you see things or whatever as things occur to you, then please feel free to do so. Um, the, the talk is rather grandly, I feel, in time for the history of St. Mary's Church. Well, it's a topic which would keep us here certainly for longer than one evening's talk. This is an ancient building. It's grown, it's changed, sometimes quite drastically, sometimes little by little as the community here has changed as liturgical fashions and deeper lying theological beliefs have changed, as the country and its rulers have altered their religious allegiances, and as prestigious and wealthy institutions and individuals have paid for changes which would showcase their own power and influence in the land. The story as told by this building is not unlike other stories related by the thousands of churches with which this country is so richly blessed. Churches which, like Bampton, were founded back in Anglo-Saxon times or even earlier, and which have continued in use to the present day. It's a history like many others, and yet a history which is, of course, unique to this place and to the people who lived and worshipped, joyed and sorrowed, loved and sometimes hated in the parish of Bampton over a period of some 1,000 years. This is the sweep of history we are trying to compress into a very few minutes this evening. So welcome then to a history, or more truthfully, to a bit of history of St Mary's Mountain. So, I'm going to begin with uh, the first section which is going to talk about the setting of this building. This building doesn't just stand alone. It's part of a community and it's also part of a whole series of religious sites in Bampton. The second thing I will say, the second part of the talk, will be about the architecture of the church as it surrounds us tonight. And particularly I want to draw your attention to the way the building has changed and developed over the last thousand years. And then the, the last bit of the talk, the sort of coda to the evening, I want to say something about some of the people involved in the story. For what is history without the people who make history? So a little bit at the end, mainly I'm afraid about clergy, but there we are. Um, it's because we've got so much information, you see. Um, clergy who have ministered here from time to time, who endeavoured, not always successfully, it has to be said, to ensure that the roof didn't fall in, and that the parishioners were baptised, married, buried, and helped through this life, suitably prepared for the next. So, to begin 
with the context, the setting of this building. This is where I want to refer you to this piece of paper. What you see here is a list of buildings or constructions, some still existing, some which have disappeared, and they're set on roughly a west to east axis. Starting at the left-hand side of the diagram, out of the west, with the Lady Well. <coughs> You'll see that on, the, on the, uh, the left of the diagram. The Lady Well is a holy and healing well, a one-time object of pilgrimage. <coughs> the site of that well forms today part of the outbuildings of Ham Court, uh, formerly Mountain Castle. Um, we're not quite clear whether the well still exists as such, in other words, whether there's actually water still there, it's been capped, it's been possibly filled in at some point. Um, I'm hopeful um, that the new owners uh, will recover it, they're keen to try and do so, and then maybe we can have a, a pilgrimage to the Holy Well in Mountain once again, maybe. If you move a little to the east, then, from the well, coming towards the west end of St Mary's, you will see a little dotted circle which says Ring Ditch, and inside the ring ditch, it says chapel. Now this is actually the site of the deanery, the house which stands to the west of the church there. The deanery as it stands today was once thought to be a 17th century house like many other Cotswold small manor houses. It was known to be built on an older site, but uh, that's what it was thought to be. However, some years ago, some serious work was done inside the deanery, and uh, they actually then uncovered the core of the deanery and discovered that there was a 12th century range of buildings there around which the later house had been built. Um, this, in fact, is the original Norman deanery, the place where the, the dean and chapter of Exeter and their bailiffs and so on um, could come uh, and inspect their lands in Bantry, about which more in a moment. But there it was, there it is, a 12th century building, and within that building, a 12th century chapel. And that's the chapel which is mentioned on this uh, diagram. It's an interesting chapel, it's a two-storey 12th century chapel. Um, it's very like the chapel which um, the then Bishop of Hereford, Robert Losinger, had built in his palace in uh, Hereford. And it is thought, it is known that Robert of Singer leased the, uh, the deanery and the lands around Mountain uh, from uh, his fellow bishop, the then Bishop of Exeter, Bishop Osborne, Fitzosborne, with lots of names, and Bishop Lozinger had a similar two-storey chapel built here in the deanery in Mountain. So, um, another religious site. Um, Two-storey chapels were rather interesting, that's entirely beside the point, but it, it, was, uh, it was based, it's believed, on the design of Charlemagne's chapel at Aachen, a very, very famous two-storey chapel, uh, which again is based on the design of uh, San Vitale in Ravenna, which again is built on the design of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. So we have a lot of... Uh, so there's a link, link here with, uh, with, with Jerusalem. So the deanery is there, the chapel is there, and uh, as I say, uh, the chapel leased from the diocese, uh, the dean, the chapter of Exeter. Which brings me to the Exeter connection, which I must get in now so to, to clear the air, and for some people rather puzzled when we talk about this church here having a link with uh, the cathedral at Exeter. Um, what has Exeter down there in Devon to do with Bampton? We are, after all, in the Diocese of Oxford today, and before that diocese was created in 1542, uh, we were a parish within the vast Diocese of Lincoln. Nothing links us otherwise with Exeter. Well, the, the Exeter link comes about through two people. First, King Edward the Confessor. The second, his chaplain, one of his chaplains, a man called Leofric. And Leofric was appointed first bishop of the new diocese of Exeter. And uh, being a new diocese, it needed funds, as do we all. And uh, in order to endow the diocese, and in order to pay part of the bishop's stipend, the king granted some of the land which he owned in his royal manor at Bampton. He granted that to Leofric to take off, as it were, the revenue from there, and to use it uh, for the dean and the chapter of his new cathedral in 
Exeter and also partly the two Ks over Stipend. The king granted him seven hides of land, and uh, with the grants of land went the advowsal of the living of Bounty, in other words, the right to appoint clergy to serve the church here. So, Dean and Chapter of Exeter gained that right along with revenues from some of the land of Bampton. The, the land is, of course, no longer owned by uh, the Dean and Chapter of Exeter, but the right to appoint clergy here uh, still is retained by them. Uh, they now retain it in, in partnership with numerous other bodies and people, but um, the right to appoint to this church is still in the hands of the Dean and Chapter of Exeter some 950 years after it was originally granted uh, traditions in, in this part of the world are pretty, pretty solid. Uh, there's an interesting document which you might like to look at later on, it's around the corner from the pulpit, um, there's a copy and a translation there which records that William the Conqueror confirmed Edward the Confessor's grant of land, um, land which had originally been given to this church, to this uh, uh, community by an earlier Saxon king, uh, rather short uh, reigning Eadwig or Eadwig, Edwig, uh, in 955-59. And Edwig gave those seven hides of land which were then transferred to Exeter, gave them, I quote from the document, to the holy man of Bampton and the community. The holy man of Bampton and the community. And that uh, gift is repeated in William's charter. And uh, also interestingly in that charter, if you have a look at it, in the, in the Anglo Saxon, it's all translated, so I uh, don't expect you to know Old English, but uh, there is a fascinating, as, as a lot of these charters are, gift charters, um, you've got all the details of the landmarks which demarcate the land, and it's very interesting to notice how many of them are still there. So you can trace the, the line of the Thames, the brooks, the uh, places like Chimney and uh, places in, in Aston are all mentioned there. Um, and are, some of them at least are recognisable today um, as defining the boundaries of the parishes here. The holy man of Bampton and the community to whom Eadwig made his gift actually brings us now to this site, this place which is the next bit along uh, on that, um, that diagram. The charter mentions a community and in Saxon times religious communities of all shapes and sizes tended to live and work and pray in what are termed minsters. Minster can refer to a building, it can refer to the actual community that uses that building. It's the same word as monastery, minster in uh, Old English, monasterium in Latin, it's a monastery. But in those days, it could refer to a monastery as post-Norman uh, people would have understood it, or it could refer to much looser kinds of communities where clergy and laity uh, lived in some kind of uh, religious community under some kind of rule or discipline. Bounton, as uh, John Blair's diagram shows by using the word minster enclosure, Bounton was one such minster community. Who was the holy man of Bampton, whose community came to occupy this site? Well, it almost certainly refers to the saintly founder of the Bampton community, the man we know as Saint Bernard, an 8th century, well probably 8th century figure, about whom we know next to nothing, as to be said, <laughs> but um, whose cult was certainly celebrated here, and whose feast day, 21st of December, is mentioned in various historic documents. Uh, indeed, had I been welcoming you to this church at any time from the late 14th century to the mid 16th century, I would have welcomed you not to St. Mary the Virgin Bounton, but to St. Bernard's Bounton. And uh, until the Reformation swept such things away, I would have certainly encouraged you to worship at the shrine of St. Bernard, which once drew numbers of pilgrims here, a shrine which contained a reliquary in which sat the head of the Blessed Saint. Well, well that's gone. It's all gone, but it was here. But then you look at this diagram, and you'll say, but um, hang on, it doesn't say St. Mary's, it doesn't say St. Mary's, it says St. John the Baptist. And indeed, had I been welcoming you here in, say, 1292, 
I can give you welcome you to the Church of St. John the Baptist in Bounty. In 1317, I might have welcomed you to the Church of St. Mary in St. John the Baptist. In 1335, I would have welcomed you to St. John the Baptist and St. Beowulf. These are all dates on which these various dedications are mentioned, and uh, it's probably a little confusing. But if you look at that diagram again, in the midst of enclosure, next to the, tri the, the rectangle, which says Church, St John the Baptist, you'll see a little triangle. And if you look at the key, you will see that a triangle represents a chantry chapel. And in fact, to the east of the Church of St John the Baptist, uh, back certainly in Anglo-Saxon and indeed in the early Middle Ages, um, there was another building out there somewhere in what is now the churchyard, a small chantry chapel dedicated to the Blessed Virgin Mary. That's where um, she comes in. And uh, what, we, what we know, again, is from various documents, is that uh, certainly in the 13th century, for example, that, that was still standing in the grounds of this church of St. John the Baptist. What happened to the chapel is known it was demolished at some point, and then um, later on, um, the dedication of the chapel was applied to the main building. Um, in the sort of 14th, 15th century, um, the Blessed Virgin Mary definitely would have trumped um, St. John the Baptist, so it would have been sort of nudged to one side, and she would have been given the glory of the dedication. Later on, when it became fashionable, um, briefly uh, fashionable for the cults of old Anglo-Saxon saints to be emphasised, that's, that's when it gets a bit of old creeping in uh, as part of the actual dedication. <coughs> well, the minster, as you can see from the diagram, stands within this huge minster enclosure. It's been partly excavated, part of the, the, the ditch, the bank, um, has been excavated, and um, the enclosure goes right round what is now Landell's, takes in Bampton Manor, Deanery Farm, part of uh, Broad Street, and the place where, by happy historical coincidence, the present vicarage has come once again to rest. Um, it's moved about a bit in time, and uh, it was for a while over in Clanfield, but uh, they came back, and it, it, it's actually ended up where it should be, within the old Minster enclosure, the, the, the sort of pull of history or something like that. Um, this enclosure, as I say, was demarcated by a bank and ditch, but within, within this sacred space, there are remains of even older enclosures and ditches. Um, the diagram mentions a ring ditch around the chapel in what is now the deanery, and um, the, uh, some geophysical surveys, which were conducted actually on the church site some years ago, appear to confirm that the church itself is built on the site of two other ring-ditched objects. Um, these are thought to be uh, Bronze Age burial mounds. So that we, we have a, a line of three, everything's in lines here. Um, a, a line, a linear series of three uh, Bronze Age burial mounds, which may well have had an attraction for the earliest pagan Anglo-Saxons making their way up the Thames Valley in the fifth and sixth centuries. What those early settlers found was a long-established <coughs> settlement of people uh, living in the area now occupied by the paddock, top of fields, and the orchard, and so on. It's there on the, on the map, the east, that stippled area, which is the old Romano-British settlement. Um, various finds have been uncovered here, including a Roman altar. At some point, the original Brythonic speaking inhabitants either moved or merged with the Teutonic Invaders whose language and customs were eventually to prevail in this part of Britain. The beam, which you see mentioned there on the east, of course, is a, an old English word meaning a tree or a wooden post. We still, we still use it in names of trees, uh, horn beams, white beams, and so on, uh, and a beam as a, as a post or a, a truss which you have in a house or other building. Possibly it was the marker of a meeting place or assembly in the original village, the original Saxon settlement which took over from the older Romano British <coughs> settlement. And uh, so that settlement became known <coughs> to our Anglo-Saxon forebears as the settlement by the 
been there and talked about it or about them. When the Christian faith arrived in these parts, due to the efforts of people like St. Marinus, from his base in 7th century Dorchester upon Thames, and other ministries, missionaries pre and especially after the arrival of St. Augustine in Canterbury, then two Christian sites appear in the general area of Bampton. The one near the beam, the site of the old settlement, which is marked on your map as St. Andrew, or Hermitage, and uh, Saxon burials have been found there. The remains of a later medieval chapel were also found there. And, uh, but this didn't become the focus of the later community, but there was a chapel there, a well-known chapel into the medieval period. Presumably Bearwald, however, decided to settle further away, perhaps from the main settlement, and uh, the minster came to grow up here at this end of the village, and ultimately that became the focus, the centre for the village of Bampton, away from the original beam, but around the site of the Holy Man and the community. When Bampton became a royal manor in the 8th or 9th century, then this community became uh, not only a community of itself, but it became the sort of parish centre for the village, and uh, it became, um, it became uh, the, the, the focus, really, for religious uh, worship and practice in this community. Um, so looking then at our chain of religious sites on this diagram, we move from the Holy Well in the West the Norman chapel, which formed part of the deanery, which represented the power of Exeter in these parts, then the Minster Church of St John the Baptist, its attendant eastern chapel of St Mary. To the far east, we have the Hermitage Chapel of St Andrew, with its burials, which predate the burials in the churchyard here. And of course, once the churchyard here became the place for burial within the parish, um, then only burials here were allowed. For people to get buried, and uh, churches jealously guarded their rights to burials because uh, they, they had the money coming in. So, uh, Bampton then became the burial place for a very, very wide area uh, around here uh, until later on when other churches gave the right to bury. But uh, this, this gathered everything to itself. Then, in between, finally. You notice two other sites. There's a triangle here denoting a chantry chapel in what is called Cat Street on this map. It's now Queen Street. Uh, records show that a chantry priest was employed to say masses here at one time, although the precise location uh, of this chapel is uh, not clear. And then finally, there's also Spittle Croft, uh, now somewhere beneath the pieces, probably. Um, Spittle being a form of the word hospital, hospice, usually referring to a building or land belonging to uh, one of the medieval religious orders of knights, uh, the Templars, and particularly the Hospitallers. We know that the Hospitallers had a small establishment at Hanfield, um, on the site of what is now Friars Court, but we don't know what Spittle Croft was actually all about. It may simply have been a piece of land which again brought revenue into the hospitals to maintain their, their various premises in the area. In any case, both this and the Chantry came along with the later the original Saxon foundations, but it's interesting that they too occupy um, a place on this, this linear site of buildings dotted throughout the community of Bampton. They may have occupied older religious territory, or were they just following, again, one of Bampton's many immemorial traditions always build in a line in Bampton. We've done so from time immemorial, and we shall do so till kingdom come. It's the sort of thing that happens here. Uh, anyway, we don't know. And, and, and that's a recurring refrain, refrain in a lot of the history of this church and indeed this community. There's a lot we don't know. A lot we don't know. But there's a broad brush outline anyway of the religious context in which this minster church of St John the Baptist Mary's Fairwald exists. If you'd like to, 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 to move yourselves around a bit now, um, I'm going to pause there before going to look inside the church of the, of the architecture. If you have any questions you want to throw at me at the moment, then I, I'm happy to, to try and uh, set up.
say something intelligent. Sounds good. The Kruger House is a type of Anglo-Saxon uh, period uh, dwelling, which is partly sunk into, into the ground, so that you actually you can step down into it, and, and, and the, the basic level is below the ground level, it's, and, and the roof then comes quite low to, towards the ground. So it's it stuck. It was uh, it's been excavated there. Um, so why 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 in German? Well, I think that's, well, it's, it's an Anglo-Saxon thing, I mean, it's a Saxon connection with uh, Saxony and uh, the German sort of homelands, as it were, and uh, I think the original archaeological work was done by German architects. Uh, yeah. I wondered if you could say anything about, um, are, are there any churchyards or any churches that are not Not that I know of, no. Not that I know of. Short answer. <laughs> <laughs> right. Let us uh, move on. To the building. Right, so you have uh, another piece of paper with various stages um, in the, the architectural development, um, more or less accurate. Um, and then on the, on the back of that, um, you've got some quick notes really on different features of the church which you can probably look at um, at the end when you uh, do a walkabout. You're not familiar with them already. I mean, there's an awful lot of detail which I'm not going to cover inevitably. This is just, you know, outline. Um, you know, so we'll be here for a long time if I get too into detail. So the top, the top picture in the, the architectural development series gives you some idea of what the original, uh, the early stone church on this site was like, okay? Um, this is, sorry, I'm, I'm wandering off her channel today, it's just filming. Uh, this is the original out external stair turret to the tower. And this would have been, you know, in, in the, uh, in the sort of the, the late, uh, at the early Norman period, the late 11th century, early 12th century, this would have been outside. Okay, so this would have been the west end of the church. Um, there would have been some sort of door here into the church, and um, the church would have been that end, with uh, it suggests a semicircular apse added onto it. Although it's not entirely sure that that was there, but it is quite likely. So that's what you had. You had the turret, you had this square bit under the, what was a massive tower, um, given the size of the church, but the, it was there, and it was this size, so a, a huge tower was built, and then uh, the uh, actual nave of the church was what is now the chancel there. And that, that's all it was. So where you're sitting, you're sitting out, out in the fresh air, uh, out in the night, and uh, that, that was it. Um, you will notice some of the herringbone stonework on this turret, which suggests its age. Uh, that's a feature. Late Saxon, early Norman. It, it's you know we're, we're not sure um, how early, how late it is, but uh, it certainly gives an indication. It's probably pre-conquest, but uh, you know what can be uh, imprecise about these things. There's more herringbone uh, work on the arch there above the Norman arch. Which is now been superseded uh, by a laser arch in order to strengthen the little tower when it was raised. And if you go into the chancel and look back to the west again, you can see above, above there a lot of this herringbone work. So th this is some of the earliest stonework in the church, and it takes us back to um, the late 11th century. Um, obviously, the earlier churches on this site may have incorporated some stonework, but uh, it may have also been. Kind of building. Um, so, also, if you go round the turrets and, and you look at it from that side, you'll see a little round-headed window there, which again is a very early, a very early window, uh, again indicating the, uh, the age of this bit of the building. The tower, as I say, it, it was massive, and in fact, it came into play as a defensive tower during um, the. Uh, time of the, the civil war between uh, Stephen and Matilda after the death of Henry I in 1135 um, until the accession of Henry II in 
1154, um, you may, I'm sure, you are aware there was a, a certain disputing of who inherited the throne. And um, Henry I's daughter, Matilda, or the Empress Maud, as you may have come across her as well, um, she laid claim to the throne, but uh, a lot of people in France saw a woman on the throne at the time, so they supported um, um, Stephen of Blois, and uh, he had himself proud, and there was a more mighty uh, civil war. Um, the Empress Maud's soldiers defended the tower and built some sort of wooden castellation on the top in order to try and prevent Stephen's troops uh, reaching Oxford. Uh, and um, there was a bit of a battle, a bit of a siege. Stephen won and took the tower by storm. So you can imagine all sorts of exciting goings on in the 12th century around this place. Um, after the time of those troubles, when things had settled down again, sometime in the mid 12th century, um, the building was remodelled. <coughs> the apse of the east was, was taken away, the nave now became the chancel, and a new nave was built out um, towards the west. Transepts were built to the, the south and the north, and so you got the cruciform shape of the church, as you can see it in the second diagram, more or less. Um, each of the apses had a chapel sticking out of it at the end, and um, you can see the remains of the archway into one of those chapels on the, uh, on the east wall of the south transept. The tower was also uh, raised at that time, just a little bit. You can see, when you go outside and you see it in daylight, you can see some different stages of the, the way the tower has been up and increased as the time has gone on. So that was the next big stage. We, we didn't have any any trance, any uh, aisles here, just a straight and simple lane uh, now leading into the, the tower area and then um, the uh, chancel. The next thing that happened was that big reconstruction works again were carried around about around the year 1270. The tower was raised again to its present height, this is the final raising of the tower, and the spire was put on. Um, an early example, really, and a very successful example of its kind, um, an octagonal spire on a square base. And uh, it causes quite a lot of architectural controversies to how you, you get around and how you do this neatly. Um, the, uh, the, the, the solution they came up with, of course, in Bampton was to have these interesting uh, buttressed statues of saints, one of our great features um, of the external appearance of St Mary's Bampton. Who the saints are, you may want to know. We know St John, well, there, there, there's the original St John over there, um, he fell down or, or so, but uh, he's safely tucked inside now, that's, that's one of the original um, uh, saints from the roof, and he was replaced um, in the 20th century. Uh, a little earlier in the 19th century, they replaced St Andrew, and again you can tell him by his uh, saltire cross, and uh, he was in danger of falling down um, in the 19th century, so they, they took him down, uh, I don't know what they did with him, but um, they certainly didn't put him inside the church, but uh, they, they put a new, a new statue of uh, St Andrew there. Who the other two are? Well, argument, discussion, debate. Um, maybe with the connection with Exeter and uh, which is dedicated to St. Peter, and you'll see various cross keys around the place, which are the, the arms of the ex cathedral, uh, St. Peter's keys. Uh, maybe St. Peter's up there, but he's so important that we just don't know. Who's the other one? Well, again, um, a later dedication within the parish uh, was to St. James, St. James the Great, the, the church in, in Aston is dedicated to him. Who knows? Maybe he, he hasn't been given up on the tower, but again, I mean, can't tell that the, the figures are so worn, and uh, there's no nice little record to say we put up the statues to so and so and so and so. so, and so, and so but uh, it's it's a fraud. So the statues were put up there. The nave walls then were pierced by these present uh, arcades, and the aisles were put in. And uh, when they were put in, um, they got these these rather interesting, uh, lovely windows, which uh, are very much uh, a feature 
of the church, um, described in Pef's work as triplets of graduated trefoil lancers set in cusped rear arches. Um, which indeed they are, I mean, that, that, that's, that's precisely what they are. And very lovely they are too. It's a sort of that, that kind of cusping, I mean, it, it's everywhere and um, it's very common, but it's sort of crept in really along the pilgrim routes from, uh, from Spain. Um, a lot of Islamic architecture has those kind of features, and um, in, in various forms and modifications, they found their way into Western architecture, and here they are in Bampton, and I think they're, they're very, very special. Um, the chapel also to the, the west of the South Transept, the church was built at the same time. Then things, I mean, they kept doing things, and, and who kept doing things? Well, the, the Dean and Chapter of Exeter kept doing things. Because um, they had the money, uh, and um, you know they, they were they were sort of planting their little flag here in this part of the country to assert their presence. And you know every now and then they would uh, they would give some uh, some money here. They would put some little monument up. There were also of course lo local um, landowners and people of importance who, who might you know um, fund a little statue here and something there. So a lot a lot went on. Um, in the early 14th century, there was another big build, um, the, the West Porch, which you can only see from the outside, of course. The Great West Porch, with its fine wallflower decoration, came um, some time after, because of another awkward um, bit that happens at the, the West End, uh, that was put in after these two great windows at the east and the west were put in. Again, very simple, very elegant, uh, very fine examples of, of their period. Uh, in the same century, what is now the vestry was, well, it, I said it, it, it was added, I think it was enlarged, because the, the older part of the vestry to the east is certainly, is certainly 12th century, if it's anything, uh, but the whole vestry was enlarged. It was a chapel, rather than a vestry, um, and uh, you can tell it was a chapel, because it's got a, a piscina, a means for washing up after mass in it. Um, we have several piscinas in the church, which indicate the place of several altars. And of course, in, in the Middle Ages, every priest uh, was expected to say daily mass and usually at a different altar. And so um, a number of altars grew up to accommodate the numbers of priests here. Yeah, I want to say something about the, the staffing of Bampton in, in the final bit of, of the talk. But um, you will notice um, the scene, um, there's one there, there's one there. One there, one in the Lady Chapel, there's obviously one by the High Altar, there's one in the Vestry. Um, there would have been an altar in the nave um, for Hoi Polloi to uh, worship, and that would have had uh, you know, a setup there. And there is also the mystery piscina and altarpiece, which I have opened up for you this evening, which has not seen the light of regular day since uh, 1870, and which is behind the altar. But you can have a look at that later on. That's the mystery thing. People, I, I said on Sunday there's a mystery. I think people were hoping I, I discovered the mythical tunnel between here and the Dean Ring. No, there is a rather, rather nicely carved altarpiece and, and niche um, now hidden when they, when they moved the organ. The organ was originally there. Um, but it hides it hide one of the, one of the, the, the several altarpieces. Church. So um, the uh, north, yes. The, so the vestry was was remodelled and made into a bigger chapel. The door into the vestry is, is clearly 12th century, and the actual wooden door is, is the oldest door in the building, um, with some 14th century uh, ironwork binding it. So that's, that's that's the oldest sort of wooden bit um, in the place. Um, the north transept, that is now the Lady Chapel, was remodelled to uh, incorporate um, a little chapel at the East End, reshaped. Uh, there is the recess in that chapel, uh, also a 14th century date. Um, its purpose, as I, as I say here, remains obscure. Um, it might have been an early Easter sepulchre. Um, some, I think, a little romantically have hoped that it might be the remains of tribes and bearings. Um, there is, at the foot of the, the recess in the Lady Chapel, 
there is the bed, the, the stone bed of a brass, showing a bishop mitred and croziered, uh, who he was. Well, he, he may have had something to do with uh, the cult of St. Bevel. Goodness knows, I don't know. So, that's the remodeling then in 12th century and into the 14th century. Then the, the final um, sort of re positive remodeling, in a way, uh, was in the 15th century. A clear story was added to the name. Um, you can see, if you look into the transepts, you can see the, the higher level of windows. You'd have had that above the stone level here in the name. Um, that, that was added. If you look in the um, south chapel there, there is an engraving from 1827 of the church as it was then and you will see the, uh, the clear stories there. So you'd have had a, a lot more light coming into the building from the top, uh, and the pitch of the roof much, much, um, much, much uh, less than it is now. The, of course, the clear story in the nave was eventually removed, and uh, it was removed in the 19th century restoration or destruction <laughs> The scraping of the church, the purifying of the interior by the architect Ewan Christian. Um, again, if you go into the uh, South Chapel there, there is a, a picture, there's a diagram on the wall, the original architect's drawings of the church in 1858, pre the uh, restoration. You will see that it contained galleries around the top, um, box pews, uh, pulpit was over in the middle there. All sorts of things were different. The floor level of the chancellor was, was lower, um, which makes sense if you look at the architecture in the chancel. Uh, the floor is now clearly too high. You try and sit on the misery court seats. Well, you need to have very short legs to sit on the chancel. <laughs> um, everything's been pushed up, the altar was brought up. Um, to be more prominent in, in, in you know, the, the thought at the time was that uh, a proper church looks well, like it does today, you know, the altar was there at the East End, there was a day, there was a choir here. Uh, of course, the problem with that in this church is that we have another choir beyond this, and so you've got a very, very long way between the people and the altar, which is why um, in the uh, 20th century um, we, we tried the uh, name altar to try and bring things a little bit more uh, close together, but an awful lot of restoration work was done. All the plaster was removed, and goodness knows what that plaster might have been, as we know from many churches. Um, medieval churches were painted, this certainly would have been painted, but uh, we're not going to find anything now. It's all gone. Um, so, well, a lot of things were done. The monuments you see in the church are almost certainly none of them where they originally were. They've all been put up. You know, and leave these things up. Well, you never put a monument up there. You can read it. Um, so they, they will be sort of put out of the way, tidied up. Everything was tidied up. The brasses in the in the chancel were tidied. They were put in different places, and apparently they are only representative of all of the brasses that were there at one time, because there are references to other brasses that, that, that were there which you know have disappeared. So an awful lot happened. The church as we see it today doesn't look as it did necessarily so in the 15th century. I have um, brought out for you this evening um, the faculty, the faculty um, which, um, of 1867, which is the permission given by the diocese to do the works. Interestingly enough, although it says a lot about the works in the chancel, it says nothing about removing the clear story. <laughs> And, uh, it, but it's suitably vague, so it allows the architect pretty well free reign to do whatever he liked. Um, it's a very dangerous document, I think. And, uh, it certainly wouldn't happen like that with uh, the Diocese Advisory Committee as it is today. Um, but there we are. Um, it's an interesting document to read. Um, and I've also put out on that table the facsimiles, uh, the, the transcripts rather, of the church registers. Rooms in a, uh, a quiet moment. Um, on the back of that document, I've got, I've, I've got a do I've squeezed a lot in. I started out with good intentions, doing, doing nice 
big subheadings here, but um, I had to give out after South Chuck because I couldn't have got all the information on. So the, there are some uh, numbers there to take you round if you want to do a little walkabout and to point out some of the, the, the salient features, though by no means all. There are many, many things. You know, you're always trying something new and something different as, as you walk around this church. But that, that is basically the sort of outline of developments. Okay, so that just hopefully gives you a picture of the way, uh, at least to some extent, in which the church has developed. So again, I'm going to pause for a moment. I'm nearly there. Um, Where did the, the galleries, the 18th century galleries, actually go? Were they on pillars or were they? Yes, just... yes. Uh, if, you, if you have a look at the, the diagram over there, they, they were they were fairly low down. But they were on the top round tops of the pillars. There was a set of stairs coming up in from the, uh, the Lady Chapel. Uh, that led you up to the top, and uh, they went all the way around. Uh, but you'd have, you still had the windows above, which would have given good light, and they didn't obscure anything. So, uh, I don't, it doesn't look as though, they were, they were quite, you know, delicate, so I, mean, I, don't, I don't think it would have been terribly impressive, although they would have covered part of the, uh, of the west window. Um, and of course you'd had all the big, you'd, you'd have been chock full of box, box pews all the way up here, and uh, it was quite, you know, quite heavy. A wooden structure or a stone structure? The galleries were wood. Yeah. wood. They were all wood, yes. Uh, put up, goodness knows, 17th, 18th century probably. Um, that sort of period, quite common. But I mean, the church, you know, the, the, it would have held an enormous number of people. I mean, given the population of Bampton, you know, and, until latter times was, was, a, was no more than 1500. It was an incredible number of people that would have been got in. Um, and, and there are, I mean, there are endless complaints in the records of various vicars and so on, you know, that, that the, people, the people treat Sunday as a, as a day off and don't even come anywhere near the church, you know. They, they're, they're too busy gaming and, 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 and lying, in, lying abed instead of coming to church. So it was a bit different there. <laughs> Okay, well, vicars, yes, vicars complaints. Well, um, I'm going to say a brief word now about, about, uh, about the clergy and my predecessors. Um, I'm sure many of you will know until, until fairly recent times, Bampton was rather unusually, though not uniquely, staffed by three vicars at the same time. In a sense, it was partly a hangover from the days when this was a Minster church, a community church, and members of the Minster community would serve the needs of what was a very widely spread rural community. In 1220, the then Bishop of Lincoln, Hugh Wells, whose vast diocese we then were, um, established the system in conjunction with the patrons of the living uh, uh, in Exeter, the system whereby three priests were appointed to the living of Bounce. Each one was assigned a portion of the living. They were known as portionists. And one looked after the, the north of the parish, one looked after the south, one looked after the east. Not the it was uh, fairly well split. Too. The east so it seems to be the poorer, the poorer relation. There, there was less endowment in the eastern portion. It was the poorer of the three livings. However, um, they were all fairly well endowed, actually. Um, in time, these portionists came to live in what are now the three former vicarages of Bampton. We actually have five vicarages in Bampton. Three ex, three ex old vicarages, an old vicarage from the 1950s, and the, the new vicarage from the 1980s. So we're rather over endowed. Um, the three former vicarages, you'll see the big houses around the church. There's Churchgate House um, by, by the gate, uh, where the South Vicar lived, and of course um, it now features. Uh, Downton Abbey, as I'm sure you know, it's where, uh, where Matthew Crawley and his mother live. Um, there's Kilmore House, home of the East Vicar, and there's Cobb House, uh, which is the, the last of the old vicarages that continue to be used as a vicarage within the living memory of many Bamptonians. And that eventually became the vicarage for the parish of Bampton, Cobb and Lou, when the old parish was split up in the 19th century. These three houses, their attendant properties, including, of course, the deanery, uh, in effect form uh, a mini close um, around what continued to be a kind of collegiate church or small minster throughout the Middle Ages 
and right through the sort of the 19th century. Um, it's quite Trollocan in its sort of feeling. You know? Yes. The stipends paid to the portionists, as I say, was quite, quite handsome. And it enabled them, in turn, of course, to employ curates to assist in the worship and the pastoral ministry of the parish. In fact, there were three portionists, each of whom would certainly have employed a curate, maybe six clergy here. Yeah. Um, and uh, on occasion, of course, um, a curate would be employed to do the work of a portionist who didn't actually reside in the parish. That was, uh, not uncommon. Uh, figures need careful interpretation, of course, but in the 13th century, for example, um, the total income which Exeter derived from the living amounted to nearly £100. It's a sum which would have financed between six and a dozen quite comfortable stipends at that time. And so they only had to pay out for three years, so Exeter did quite well out of it, but it was a portion still quite well out of it. Uh, on a number of occasions, one individual held two portions at a time, and several vicars over the years uh, never actually came near the parish from which they derived their income. <laughs> Dr. Cotton, for example, prebend of Exeter, treasurer of the cathedral and archdeacon of Cornwall, held a portion from 1663 to 1684 without once ever visiting that. <laughs> And during the same unfortunate period, from 1669 to 1684, another vicar, Stephen Phillips, who was Archdeacon of Shropshire and a canon of Hereford Cathedral, may have visited Bampton, but he certainly never actually resided here. Their work done, was done by lowly paid curates. Um, I suppose having Clanfield residents here tonight, I ought to mention my notorious predecessor in both parishes, um, Thomas Middleton. But his dates here, which is for the 19th century. And he was vicar of Clanfield, he was a portionist in Bampton, he was master of Bampton Grammar School. He was rarely seen by the parish and almost never seen the school. <laughs> he paid an Oxford scholar the princely sum of £20 a year to take services for him. His stipend from Bampton alone would have been around £500. So he was doing quite well, really, for doing nothing. Many of Bampton's priests came originally from Devon, of course, uh, as a result of the connections with Exeter. Bampton was conveniently close to Oxford for those priests of a studious nature, and conveniently far from Exeter for those priests of a troublesome nature. <laughs> and there certainly appear to have been a number of turbulent priests in the parish over the years. Uh, a complete list isn't available, and there are a lot of gaps in alias that we try to compile. Um, John Blair, again, has done uh, sterling work in this area with regard to the medieval clergy, and he gives us a couple of interesting glimpses into the daily lives and concerns of at least some of the members of Bampton's community in, for example, the 14th century. A century, for example, when the, the two clergy commemorated in the brasses in the channel, in, in the chancel, um, Pimswood and uh, Holcott. Uh, were actually vicars here. For instance, in 1318, vicars Bythewall and Beeston were engaged in a long-standing conflict with the rector of Standlake. It was over disputed tithes. And if you look at it, if you look at the map of the parishes, you'll find lots of bits where there are enclaves of, of Bampton in Standlake, and there are enclaves of Standlake in Bampton. So it, it was a, you know, a recipe for confusion. Anyway, the whole thing came to a head when uh, the two vicars confronted the rector of Stanley in Brighthampton Fields. There was a sort of stand-up fight. <laughs> <laughs> it, didn't end the, it didn't end the problem, it just dragged on for years more. Um, in 1386, all three portionists went on to London to represent Exeter in a dispute with the rector of Ducklington. They won, but then they spent years arguing among themselves over the legal costs, which were rather higher than any of them had expected. <laughs> Within the parish of Bampton, there were certainly plenty of occasions for the vicars to quarrel with one another, with parishioners, and with the Dean and Chapter of Exeter. For instance, when the church was lavishly remodelled in the, in the late 13th, 13th, 14th century, the vicars flatly refused to do anything about the chancel. 
The dean and chapter said that the chancel was the vicar's responsibility. And they claimed that since 1220, when the whole system was started, the vicars, I quote, who notoriously take more than three parts of the fruits and revenues of the church, had always repaired the defects of the chancel and its books and ornaments. Well, the vicars weren't having any of that, thank you very much. Um, it took a couple of centuries. <laughs> yeah, a couple of centuries of wrangling and standoffs before the vicars won that particular fight. We are not liable for the chancel. Um, and when the church, uh, when the, um, a, a, another building work was done in, uh, in, in the, uh, yeah, so the 15th century, the chapter paid £42, two shillings and eightpence for the reconstruction of the chancel. But nothing could be done to it, so it was falling down. Um, the vicars condescended then jointly to pay half the wages of the mason and the carpenter. That was it. But even that was offset because the chapter actually purchased timber from one of the vicars, Vicar Clark, to the value of six shillings and tuppence. So he did all right. <laughs> from time to time, the vicars were also taken to court by their parishioners. During the 15th century, for instance, the vicars were taken to court four times for leaving piles of dung in the roadway. <laughs> Including the occasion in 1490 when Vickers Pope and Clark, names for Vickers, Pope and Clark, I quote, allowed their servants to throw dung and other foul things before the tenements of divers tenants, thereby making a great dung heap, which caused water to overflow and flood the halls, chambers, and other houses of the said tenements. It should, of course, be said by way of balance that not all my predecessors were such colourful litigious or idle characters. Many did reside here, or at the very least made efforts to ensure that the curates they employed were diligent and conscientious priests. The church registers give unbroken testimony to the faithful carrying out of baptisms, marriages, and burials from 1538 until the present day. And I have no reason to doubt that all those things were done decently and in order for six centuries and more before that starting date. Masses were said and sung, or after the Reformation, divine service and Holy Communion were celebrated on a regular basis, as this church remained at the heart of the community, its elegant spire pointing all parishioners, great and small, to higher things and greater claims on their life than the merely mundane. Every day, fresh history is being created. The story I've outlined tonight is one thread in a wondrously woven work to which we're all contributing. Because you already have, but really that was absolutely fascinating and clearly everybody's enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This little one the, here. The, 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 the three, this little mm. sort of threefold arrangement would have been the, um, would have been an altarpiece. It might have, it might have had little statues in the niches. And, and, so on. and the larger one back there? The larger one would have been uh, for putting the vessels, the vessels in, it would have had a piscina in it. Um, Do what a piscina is? Right, a piscina is, is like a washing up bowl. It's where, it's where the, um, the water after cleaning the vessels after communion is poured down and it's got a, a hole in it which runs to earth. Um, same thing as in a, in a baptismal font, the water goes down the plug hole. Oh, I wondered earth. how you got the water out yes. of there. It's a soak away? It's a soak away, yeah. 